The Great Sioux War of 1876 stands as a pivotal chapter in the history of the American West, marked by the valiant resistance of indigenous leaders against encroaching U.S. forces. At the forefront of this struggle was the legendary Lakota war chief Crazy Horse, whose indomitable spirit and strategic brilliance left an indelible mark on the annals of the Old West. The war culminated in a series of decisive battles, with the Battle of Little Bighorn serving as the defining moment of the conflict. However, our focus extends beyond this renowned engagement, delving into the lesser explored events leading up to and following Crazy Horse's last stand. The essay traces the intricate tapestry of conflicts, from the encounters at the Dull Knife Fight to the climactic showdowns at Wolf Mountain. It unravels the complexities of Crazy Horse's strategic decisions, examining his alliances with other indigenous leaders and the challenges faced by their communities. Beyond the battlefield, the narrative encompasses the harsh winter campaigns, the tragic aftermath of surrender, and the untimely demise of Crazy Horse, shedding light on the multifaceted dimensions of this tumultuous period. Following engagements between soldiers from Fort Fetterman and Wyoming Territory, led by Brigadier General George Crook, and the Northern Cheyenne in 1876, including the Battle of Powder River, Battle of Prairie Dog Creek, Battle of the Rosebud, and the Battle of Slim Buttes, General Crook, bolstered by reinforcements at Goose Creek, Wyoming, set his sights on Crazy Horse. In October 1876, upon learning of a Cheyenne village, Crook dispatched Colonel Renald S. McKenzie to locate it in the southern Powder River country. Colonel McKenzie embarked from Camp Robinson, Nebraska, commanding nearly 1,000 soldiers across 11 companies from the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th United States Cavalry Regiments. Accompanying them were 400 Indian scouts, representing various tribes such as Pawnee, Shoshone, Arapaho, Sioux, Bannocks, and Cheyenne, each under different leaders. The expedition, totaling 1,500 officers and men, departed Fort Fetterman on November 14, 1876. Colonel Richard I. Dodge led four dismounted companies of the 4th Artillery and 11 infantry companies from the 4th, 9th, 14th, and 25th Regiments. The medical staff, comprising six surgeons, also accompanied the force. The scouts diligently scoured the terrain up to 40 miles, covering the front, flank, and rear, while the cavalry advanced, prepared to retreat to the infantry if needed. A substantial train of 168 wagons, 7 ambulances, 219 drivers and attendants, 400 mules, and 65 packers supported the column. Seeking shelter from a snowstorm, the expedition waited at Fort McKinney until November 22nd. On November 23rd, a Cheyenne Indian from the Red Cloud Agency brought crucial information to the soldiers. There was an extremely large Cheyenne village located at the source of Crazy Woman Creek, further upstream from the current U.S. camp, nestled in a Bighorn Mountains Canyon. In response to this intelligence, Colonel McKenzie received orders to lead the Indian scouts and almost the entire cavalry, excluding one company, in pursuit of the village. Accompanied by 1,000 men, including one-third who were scouts, McKenzie embarked on this mission. On November 25, 1876, Mackenzie successfully located the camp of Dole Knife and Little Wolf on the Red Fork of the Powder River. The Cheyenne warriors were in the midst of a celebration following their recent victory over a Shoshone village. Choosing to strike at dawn, Mackenzie launched an attack, compelling the warriors to abandon the village. Some were compelled to leave behind their clothing, blankets, and buffalo robes, fleeing into the frozen countryside. Chief Dullknife and his warriors resisted fiercely, engaging in prolonged combat. The Pawnee warriors, fighting alongside the soldiers, displayed remarkable skill against the Cheyenne. Tragically, 2nd Lieutenant John A. McKinney of the 4th United States Cavalry Regiment, along with five enlisted men, lost their lives in action. 
Despite this stiff resistance, Chief Dolnive's Cheyenne warriors eventually retreated, abandoning their village. The entire Cheyenne settlement, consisting of 200 lodges and all of its belongings, were completely destroyed, and the soldiers captured approximately 700 head of livestock. Dolnive bore the heavy personal cost of the conflict, losing three of his sons in the battle. The immediate aftermath was marked by a desperate struggle against the biting cold of the night, causing immense suffering. Heartbreakingly, 11 infants succumbed to the freezing temperatures, cradled in the arms of their famished mothers. Amidst these grim conditions, the U.S. soldiers recovered artifacts from the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Dolnife's followers found themselves stranded in the harsh November weather, lacking adequate clothing, and many fell victim to frostbite. As the days unfolded, some women and children succumbed to the unforgiving cold, and in a state of hunger and freezing despair, numerous survivors opted to surrender at Camp Robinson, Nebraska, a process that unfolded by April 1877. Those who surrendered faced exile to the Southern Cheyenne Reservation in Indian Territory. Their year on the reservation was marked by the ravages of disease and hunger, leading to a dire situation for many, including Dolnife and his followers. Eventually, they seized an opportunity to escape, giving rise to what would later become known as the Northern Cheyenne Exodus. However, some resilient survivors chose a different path, opting never to surrender. A considerable portion of Dolnife's band journeyed north along the Bighorn Mountains, eventually reaching the Upper Tongue River regions. Some even joined Chief Crazy Horse's Oglala Sioux Camp on Beaver Creek, demonstrating their determination to forge a new path in the face of adversity. Unfortunately, this new path would be defined by its dead end, a dead end to not only the Great Sioux War of 1876, but to the legacy of Crazy Horse's war chiefdom at large. After the infamous defeat of Lieutenant Colonel George Custer on June 25, 1876, in the Battle of Little Bighorn, the United States government responded by dispatching a substantial number of reinforcements into Montana Territory. As autumn arrived, select bands of the Sioux and Cheyenne tribes cautiously returned to reservations and agencies, seeking food and annuity goods in anticipation of the impending winter. The relationship soured when the United States Congress insisted that the tribes relinquish the Black Hills to the government in exchange for the promised provisions. The military's takeover of agency administration, displacing civilian contractors, further fueled distrust amongst war bands, prompting them to avoid these locations. General Nelson Miles led a diverse force comprising infantry, artillery, and cavalry to pursue Sitting Bull's band, effectively defeating them by December. Similarly, Renald S. McKenzie achieved victory over Dolnive's Cheyennes, who braved snow and icy conditions to unite with Crazy Horse in the Tongue River Valley. Faced with the approaching winter and the dire situation of Dolnive's band, Crazy Horse opted for negotiations with the army to secure peace. However, a tragic turn of events unfolded when a group of United States Army Crow Scouts murdered Crazy Horse's delegation, sparking the War Chief's demand for revenge. In response, Crazy Horse initiated a series of small raids to lure Colonel Miles out of Tongue River Cantonment. In December 1876, Colonel Miles, leading a significant force comprising nine infantry companies, pursued Crazy Horse by marching south through the Tongue River Valley. On January 7, 1877, Miles captured a few northern Cheyennes, and his force of 436 men set up camp along the Tongue, just south of present-day Bernie, Montana. That night, a fresh layer of deep snow blanketed the landscape, accompanied by plummeting temperatures. In the early hours of the morning, as gunfire echoed through the air, Colonel Miles swiftly organized a defensive perimeter along a prominent ridgeline. The most striking feature of this position was a small, 
conical-shaped knoll, later named Battle Butte. To fortify their defense, two artillery pieces were strategically placed beside it, offering a commanding view of the clear field below. At 7 o'clock a.m. sharp, Crazy Horse and Two Moon initiated a series of relentless attacks on the soldiers. Faced with the formidable firepower of the army, the warriors regrouped multiple times, attempting to launch fresh assaults. However, each effort proved frustratingly futile, prompting Miles to shift his reserves strategically to bolster critical positions and thwart any flanking maneuvers. In a bid to break the deadlock, Miles gave the order for several companies from the 5th Infantry to advance toward a series of hills occupied by the warriors. The soldiers, contending with both the challenging terrain and deep snow, faced significant struggles in capturing the hills. Despite the obstacles, they managed to secure seven of the strategic positions. And as weather conditions deteriorated, the Sioux and Cheyenne, recognizing the challenging circumstances, reluctantly withdrew from the field. The culmination of these events resulted in a tactical draw, with neither side claiming a decisive victory. While the engagement resulted in a draw on the surface, it undeniably served as a strategic triumph for the U.S. Army. The significance lay in the demonstration that even during the harsh winter conditions, the Sioux and Cheyenne were not impervious to the military's reach. The battle had a profound impact, prompting a number of individuals to discreetly slip away and make their way back to reservations. As the winter waned and spring approached, this trend gained momentum. By the time May arrived, Crazy Horse, recognizing the changing dynamics, led his surviving band into Camp Robinson, opting to surrender. The events of the battle had not only altered the course of the conflict, but it also compelled a reassessment of the practicality of prolonged resistance in the face of the army's persistent presence. In May 1877, Crazy Horse and fellow Oglala leaders formally surrendered at the Red Cloud Agency near Fort Robinson, Nebraska. And for the next four months, Crazy Horse resided at the agency, drawing attention that sparked jealousy amongst Lakota leaders Red Cloud and Spotted Tail. Rumors circulated about Crazy Horse's inclination to return to traditional ways of life, causing unrest. In August 1877, news of the Nez Perce breakout reached Camp Robinson. When asked to join the army against them, Crazy Horse and Minikonju leader Touch the Clouds objected, citing their promise of peace upon surrender. Misinterpretation of Crazy Horse's words led to tensions, and with growing trouble at the Red Cloud Agency, General George Crook was ordered to intervene. A council was planned but canceled over an alleged threat from Crazy Horse to kill General Crook. Crook ordered Crazy Horse's arrest, and on September 4, 1877, Troops moved against his village, finding it deserted. Crazy Horse had fled to the Spotted Tail Agency with his ailing wife, and after meetings with military officials, Crazy Horse agreed to return to Fort Robinson. On September 5, 1877, Crazy Horse, Lieutenant Jesse M. Lee, and others set out for Fort Robinson. Despite protests from Lee, orders were received to arrest Crazy Horse. In a struggle to escape, Crazy Horse was fatally stabbed with a bayonet by a guard member. He was attended to by the post-surgeon, the infamous Valentine McGillicuddy, but succumbed to his injuries late that night, marking the tragic end of a significant figure in the Old West.